Hello, welcome to the Belmont Journal. My name is Kim Haley Jackson, your guest host for today. With us, we have Chantel Washington, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Director for Belmont Public Schools. During this interview, I will refer to her as the DEI Director. Welcome, Chantel. Thanks for having me, Kim. It is our pleasure. Yeah. Um, why don't you give us a little bit of information about yourself? Um, so I know you've been with us for about a year and a half since yes. September of 21. Exactly. So can you give us a little bit of your background? Sure, yeah. So before um, coming to Belmont, I actually lived in Georgia and worked at a private uh, liberal arts college doing diversity work there. So I did, um, I was the director of student diversity initiatives and before that I worked in higher ed here in Massachusetts doing similar work and before that I worked in different educational nonprofits um, doing work with students around the city of Boston um, and on the outskirts. So uh, that's a little bit about my background. Um, I went to Hamilton College in upstate New York um, and I got my degree in liberal arts, but focused on like um, Africana studies, so the African diaspora. So it's always been like a passion of mine, like social justice topics and these type of topics about race, culture, and things of that nature. So that's kind of how I got here, moving back home to Boston. Okay, great. We are lucky to have you. Thank you. Um, f so for our audience today, why don't you let us know what the role of the DEI director is and why is it important to our district? Yeah, so the DEI director, I guess, you know, in different industries or organizations or districts, it can be a little bit different. Um, but essentially, our role is here to advocate and support and center equity in the district. And so my role is you know, kind of playing a strategic partner with the district to help center equity in all that we do in every area of the district. And I think it's important, um, one, there has been a wave of new DEI directors across Massachusetts, which is a really great sign of folks seeing that this is a need. We want to really be able to support students, all of our students, no matter, you know, their gender, their race, their culture, um, and make sure that they're successful in Massachusetts. So um, that's really the goal of DEI directors, and we do this work in context of our district. Okay. And with that, I heard you mention um, equity. So can you give the audience, a, can you expound on the differences between equity versus equality? Yeah, so this one, it's, it's kind of better to give examples. I don't know if you've ever seen that image with like the tree and the tree is a little bent like over and folks are trying to get the, um, the character in the image is trying to catch an apple. And so the idea is that equality is, you know, we put two people there and they try to get apples, you know, whatever way. The tree, the side that's bent over, might be a little bit easier for the person over there to get it because obviously the apples are leaning more towards that person. Um, again, equality would be giving them the resources to try to get the apples, right? And so, again, you might have an equal level of ladder, like same height, mm -hmm. but the person who has it leaned more towards them have the ability to get the fruit better than the person who doesn't. And so equality is more so of us giving folks the resources that they need to be able to get the fruit, essentially, and thinking about the structures that um, cause barriers for folks to, to be able to do that. Um, and so that image, if you've seen it before, it, it has evolved over the, the years um, since it's come out to include justice as well. Um, and justice would be kind of like helping the tree to stand up more straight so that there is a better opportunity um, for folks to come at the fruit from an equal playing field, essentially. So it's really giving, um, equity is really giving people what they need to be successful, especially when we think about folks who are often minoritized or pushed push to the margins of society. There, um, we have to take into consideration the structures that may cause them to have disadvantages or folks to have advantages. So taking that into consideration um, in education is really important as well because we think, you know, you know, blanket education or blanket um, policies or practices in schools are equal without taking into consideration what a student may be going through or what their family may be going through or what, you know, just what they bring to the situation, the context. So 
um, that's a little bit of how you can distinguish between equity and equality. Okay, thank you. And so with that, um, what were some of the goals you've accomplished your first year with us? Yeah, so this year we had uh, some strategic priorities from the district, and so the central office team um, came together and the superintendent um, identified three areas that he wanted to focus on. One being, of course, the budget, which is a big topic issue this year. The other, obviously, the um, reconfiguration of the district as we continue to open new schools, um, and then DEI work. And so in my area of DEI, we decided to focus on diversifying the workforce, um, utilizing our equity teams in the district to advance equity goals. And um, we are also working with a new group of, um, a new committee in the district to help with the diversifying of the goals. And so um, in advancing that to, to move the work forward. So those are some of the things. So to start last year, I did uh, create a, a bias response tool and so we still are working on that outside of those priorities. We're still working on the bias um, tool, um, cultivating that tool and helping our district to become aware of the tool and how to use the tool so that we can gather information about what's going on in the district. Uh, the new committee is really uh, uh, the DEI hiring and retention team, a lot of words, um, <laughs> is really committed to, to learning and figuring out strategies to help Belmont become more diversified. And so right now, what we were able to accomplish is uh, develop a training that we will use and pilot with our other job searches throughout the year, um, an implicit bias training, to make sure that folks have this information top of mind as they're going in and interviewing candidates. We also are working on creating um, a question bank, so equity-focused questions that everyone can ask in their interview process. So giving folks examples of what that could look like um, and shaping that work a little bit. Um, I feel like I'm going to forget all the things. There's, there's a lot of things going yeah. on. You probably remember <laughs> some too, but um, yeah, maybe with more questions, I'll, I'll remember as we go along. But yeah, it's, it's a lot of work, and, and the equity teams are really doing well to come up with you know goals and support the building leaders um, with advancing equity and addressing bias um, and diversity in their buildings. So um, it's, it's a lot of work, a lot of work going on. So it it's is. Good. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a bit about the importance of diversifying uh, the faculty and staff within our schools? So, you know, we know from at least the diversity task force reviewed the amount of uh, diverse staff and faculty members yeah. within the Belmont Public Schools and townwide. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of work to do, but can you talk about the importance of having a diverse faculty for our students? Yeah, definitely. You know, the students are at the core of everything we do and, you know, that's the goal, right? Like the goal is to make sure we're improving outcomes for our students. And so some of the research behind this work is that we know that students' representation is really important. And there's a lot of studies and a lot of emerging research coming out about um, the impact that teachers of color can have on students of color in particular, in all students. Um, the studies are showing us that uh, teachers of color tend to have really high expectations of all of their students. And so they kind of raise the bar for everyone. Um, which is something that we're seeing lacking with students of color. If you look at the you know, achievement data, we see that our students across the board, across the nation, students of color tend to um, not achieve at the same rate as some of their peers. And so we wanna address that, and that happens here in Belmont as well. And so we know that also um, there's a, a research study out there that talks about how between the grades of first grade in, I wanna say third or fifth grade, having just one teacher of color really increases the, um, the chances of going to college for especially males of color or black boys of color. And so the power of having a, a teacher of color, that's just like, I don't know, that just warms my, it's amazing 
to think about, you know, how much of an impact teachers have on students in the trajectory of their whole entire lives. So um, that's a big um, part of why this work is important for our students. They need to see it. They need to see themselves and know that, um, you know, different folks can be in positions of authority. Um, you know, for our white students as well to see other people that don't look like them in different positions so that they know um, what folks are capable of as well. Okay. Um, I'd like to backtrack a little bit and talk about the incident reporting. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk about what that incident report looks like? Um, so our schools, you know, as you know, uh, this was why we brought you here. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, there's been a, a lot of racial incidents. Um, you know, towards all of our students. So our genderqueer students, our, you know, Asian American students, our black and brown students are particularly targeted um, with these incidents. And so, you know, in working to bring up the incident report, can you talk about what that looks like from your end and what that process is? Yeah, so we created um, this last year. This was one of the first big projects that I worked on in this role alongside the the equity audit and implementing the equity audit. And, and that's also one of the results that came from the equity audit that we did was that we wanted to have a mechanism for students in particular to be able to share um, and report bias as it's happening. And so um, what happens is anyone can fill out a report. It, like I said, it's you know normally intended for students, especially because it can be anonymous. And so sometimes we know students don't always want to talk to us and tell us what's going on or feel like they're throwing their friends or someone under the bus, um, but they do want to vocalize or express what's happening and what they're experiencing. And we want to know that. And so anyone can fill out a bias report um, and they can tell us the nature of the incident, whether they witnessed it, whether they were target of it, um, whether someone told them about it and they're just completing the form for that person. Um, all of that is okay. And what happens is the form comes to me, all of the forms come to me, as well as um, the school leaders who are indicated on the form. So if you're filling out a form for the high school, the form will go to the principal there. And um, an immediate investigation will start. Uh, whether we know who's involved or not, if we have enough Im information, we will start an investigation. And so um, that is the process right now. The, the big part of or the reason, um, purpose behind this reporting system is to give us some knowledge, tools, and insight into what's happening, what our culture and climate is in the schools, and then start to think about how we can develop initiatives or interventions to make sure that we are uh, mitigating bias as much as we can. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about the incident reporting form. Okay. Can you give us some examples um, from elementary to the high school level about some of the incidents that you've come across recently? Um, yeah, I'll give like um, some like kind of made up ones. So like from elementary, it can be anything from, you know, just certain interactions or microaggressions on the playground or, you know, certain patterns that they're seeing with students um, depending on race, whether it be touching an Afro texture, a person's hair with Afro texture or saying something maybe derogatory along with that. Um, you know, in getting older, maybe making like monkey sounds at people of color or um, straight up using racial slurs, um, writing it, saying it to people, um, any like form of that. Those are all different examples of um, bias incidents. So um, you don't really have to, there's so much more in it and every situation is very complex and nuanced and can be extremely different. Um, and we don't want people to have to worry about whether or not something that they witnessed was actually considered bias or not. We just want them to report it. And then we can do that through our investigation to figure out, okay, was this bias? And um, how do we wanna address it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Are there plans in place to, and I know we're still in the early stages of collecting that data. Mm -hmm. um, so once that data is collected, would that be shared with the Department of Secondary Education? Um, right now, we don't have plans for that because I don't think um, 
DESE, the Department of Secondary, um, Elementary and Sec Secondary Education, has a way to like collect that information from us. They haven't asked us for that yet, other than like bullying information. So if there's like race-based bullying, that information will go to DESE. Um, but um, in terms of automatically, I don't think so. Um, I'm thinking of other ways that it could be reported, I guess, like through suspension data mm -hmm. or, you know, discipline data of, you know, if someone is suspended or something like that from an incident, then that type of information will go to DESE. But just in general, not yet. Hopefully there will be some changes in the state where they, you know, develop more um, protocols for us and all of us to, to kind of standardize this process. But I will work to um, publish that data in the district. Does the DEI office have access to um, disciplinary records? So, and, and I'll give a little context mm -hmm. as to why I'm asking. So our report card came out from DESE mm -hmm. um, this past year, this week, mm -hmm. um, excuse me. So if you looked at the data, um, it would appear that most children who were suspended were either uh, deemed high risk students, students with disabilities, mm -hmm or students who identified as students of color. Mm -hmm. um, so that doesn't really necessarily line up. You know, we're not sure with some of the racial incidents that are happening, but mm -hmm. it's certainly concerning that students that look like they would be in a protected status are often the ones who are um, yeah. suspended or, yeah, there were, there were no expulsions, but students who were definitely suspended. Yeah. Yeah, and there are a lot of changes coming down the pike with that um, in the state in terms of uh, suspensions and what will be necessary in order for us um, schools to be able to suspend students. Um, there needs to be more of like an education or inter intervention on the behalf of schools um, to be able to um, suspend students. But I honestly can't even talk that much about that because they, that, that regulation just came out. So there will probably be more information and we'll probably follow up about that, you know, off air in our meetings. But um, there's a lot coming out. And I think part of it could be in support of or um, as a way to kind of address that. There is, there's definitely a disproportionate amount of students of color, or low income students or students with disabilities who um, are suspended. And that's something that we talk about in the district a lot in terms of how we wanna address that. And so I guess the way that um, this kind of idea co comes alongside the um, bias incident reporting is that we're developing tools, responses, and better protocols and consistency across the board to respond to some of these topics so that it's not so disproportionate. Um, and so that, yeah, it's just a topic. So it's a topic that we're, we're still in talks of and, and trying to figure out what can maybe be alternatives and what, um, yeah, consistency we have across the board. Um, in terms of what we could do instead. And so the handbooks in the schools have a lot of different options right now. Um, and every level is different, of course, but um, restorative practices have been a lot more popular um, in, in schools across the board. Um, so that is something that we talk about in the district as well, when that type of, um, you know, um, I don't want to say it's like a consequence or something, but when that sort of intervention is necessary based on what type of infraction. Um, but yeah, for now, we still have the same sort of like, you know, different consequences available for students. And I think that this new regulation in term in these in this data is going to really force us to think and be more intentional about how we um, do discipline for our students and how we support them. Okay, there's a lot of talk about, at least in the community, around what the disciplinary actions look like if if there is a person who, you know, is the, the known offender. Mm -hmm. But my next question would really like to center on the um, social and emotional health of our students, of those affected by yeah. these events. So um, can we talk a little bit about maybe not what's happening, but what should happen mm -hmm. to ensure the social and emotional health of the students who are directly affected. 
I ask that particularly because you brought up the, the equity audit, mm -hmm. um, which was done by members of MIT. Um, we saw a lot of um, concerns around students' mental health that wow. ran the gamut from, you know, our middle schoolers having, you know, who identified as genderqueer, a lot of suicidal ideation to, you know, students of color not feeling like they belonged yeah. um, at the high school. So, you know, it's our role as a community to educate our students, but I think there is an emotional factor that's missing. Mm -hmm. So what can the DEI office do? And DEI office meaning you're the, you're the one-man band. <laughs> <laughs> For now, you do have yes. a lot of community support. Yeah. Um, but what can, what, what would be most helpful to yeah. make sure that, you know, we center the focus on making sure that our children are safe. Yeah. And so that's like, you know, at the heart of the work that we do. And so um, I guess the answer is, uh, you know, making sure that we have enough um, that students feel like they have someone that they can connect to. Um, in the building, and that was something that we saw in the equity audit with some um, students, and even in vocal data from the MCAS data, um, climate data that we received for our district, that they feel as if they don't always have someone to connect with, and and so bringing in that sense of social emotion social emotional learning which we call SEL bringing in you know culturally responsive teaching and seeing the um, identity and experiences and backgrounds of our students as really valuable uh, um, a, and a valuable part of the way that they learn and how they learn um, is going to be really important and so supporting our educators to kind of implement more of those instructional practices um, and just thinking about the way that they have their everyday interactions with students those are some of the big way like um, they sound sort of minute but they sound really minuscule but they really will have a huge impact on building strong relationships with students and that will be um, you know, hopefully reflected in their um, outcome data. Okay. Mm -hmm. A lot of our um, action steps appear to be very reactive. Mm -hmm. um, so moving toward more of a proactive um, action, you know, do we have steps in place to educate our student body to avoid further incidents? Yeah, so we definitely have um, opportunities for students to be able to give more voice and have more space to process when incidents do happen. We um, do have ideas and thoughts in, in um, different, it just depends on the school, obviously, and the school leader and how they want to do this work. But a lot of it is looking at the curriculum, what we're learning. Um, and diversifying that so that all students are exposed and get the content context in the background, you know, um, and understand the lingo. Sometimes students don't even understand like terms that they're using are offensive. And so um, really integrating that more into our everyday and the work that we do as educators um, are always for that to be helpful. Um, but every school is working on like a different initiative. If you go to school committee, like we will continue to talk more about this and um, even at our equity subcommittee meetings of the school committee, I want to invite like Isaac, um, Isaac Taylor, the principal of the high school, to come and talk specifically towards the initiatives because I'm not doing it great justice. But each school is working um, in really meaningful ways to to do this work in their buildings. Good. Mm -hmm. um, so what? can the community do mm -hmm. in order to assist you in your goals? What's most helpful? Um, hmm, I always get this question. I always like think I have an answer, but I don't know. <laughs> I know, I appreciate it. I mean, just the showing support is really great. Um, and asking questions and not making assumptions is, is really great as well. You know, asking us what's going on, what we think would be best or why certain things are happening. So we engage in dialogue um, and, you know, not feel like accused or something like sure. that because it's just never a, a fruitful conversation in that way. But um, I think for me, 
um, is just folks to, to have a counter narrative. I say this, but it's really important for people to bring their specific um, issues and stories and backgrounds and needs to the school and um, to the school um, school committee and let folks know what their needs are. So bringing all kinds of difference to the table is going to be important. And what do you think, um, what is a misconception about DEI that you would like to clear up for our community? Ooh, there's so many. It, right? <laughs> <laughs> there's so many. Okay, so I guess not a misconception, but um, I think that, you know, the denial, the ignoring, the, you know, not talking about certain topics of people or certain identity aspects of an individual is completely um, alienating and it's, it's um, hurtful and dehumanizing to people. And so um, it's important for us to talk about difference. It's important for us to teach about difference because this is the experience that our students are having. So I guess that's a big one that's at the forefront of my mind. Um, just not, um, you know, this work is to humanize one another, right? Like we want to bring light to the differences that we bring to the table and how that contributes to everyone. So I would say that. But we still have much work to do and I'm looking forward to doing it and collaborating with you, Kim. So yeah. Well, thank you. It was it was well needed to have this position, I think, because you know, for so long, um, you know, there is a perception that things aren't happening, right? Mm -hmm. Kids also don't communicate a lot. Mm -hmm. So if they have a place for, you know, for them to go to report, yeah. not without necessarily talking to their parents, right? Because sometimes that, that is uncomfortable. So yeah. I think the reporting will, will come a long way. Um, before we wrap up, I know people tend to think about DEI as primarily related to race. Mm -hmm. um, and and we could probably have a whole, not a probably, we could have yeah. a whole conversation about um, other areas of DEI and how that touches. But I, I specifically want to bring about the work of DEI in terms of working um, with our special education community. Mm -hmm. What does that look like from the DEI perspective? Yeah, I mean, DEI en encompasses a lot, right? Like, so not only race, um, but um, I guess if you think about many of the protected classes, right, which is definitely our, um, you know, students with disabilities, um, that encompasses it all. You know, making sure that we're providing equitable opportunities for um, everyone um, in various identity categories is going to be important. So a lot of this work happens in our student services department. Um, and, and they're doing a lot too. Um, so I'll bring in more of like some of the work that they're doing connected to this as well, but making sure that, you know, they're educating um, their staff and, um, you know, bringing in more supports for our educators and our students, um, collaborating with, you know, uh, organizations like Lab and things like that. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of work that like I haven't even begun to scratch the surface on and even having organizations like CPAC where their you know, role is to really advocate for students and make sure that their needs are being met. But many of the things that I do, like the reporting form and everything um, is for all students and to be included um, in their experiences. So we wanna hear all of that information and what they're experiencing. Well, thank you, thank Chantel, you. for your time today. We know you are a very busy woman. Um, thank we you. thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on today's Belmont Journal. Hopefully we will bring Chantel Washington back for a follow-up. Um, see you soon, Belmont. <laughs>